Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Well, a little bit of an impromptu conversation, stimulated by a quick text message and Twitter conversation that I was having this morning. But I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Nick Davy. Nick, welcome to the show. Hi, Stuart. Um, starting point, as always, um, tell us your story. What's the what's the background? Um, yeah, sure. So I'm a I'm a hockey coach. Um, I've been um, full time doing that as my job for the last sort of six years. Um, before that, I probably had oh, 10 or 12 years as, as, of being, if you like, a volunteer coach in club. Um, from playing the game, I originally did sports science at university a long time ago. Did a level one whilst I was at university, did very little with it sort of straight away after. Mm. And then uh, joined a club up here in Lancaster um, in my mid twenties and sort of very quickly then became sort of embroiled as, as you do in the general, uh, running of the club and sort of feeling, I suppose, a bit of a, uh, a desire to sort of help out and to pitch in. So that's sort of where my coaching sort of journey began. Um, once I sort of then started thinking about doing a level two and that kind of thing, I got involved in the, the, the sort of single system right at the kind of the, the grassroots, the kind of North Lancashire level mm -hmm. with the under 13 boys as an assistant coach. I did some manager work at J a JRPC, so getting some experience basically of working with more experienced coaches and so on and so forth and sort of taking me through to a point where I decided that actually this was a lot more fun than my actual job, <laughs> um, you know. Um, and then so sort of took a bit, managed to actually sort of time it really well that just as I was sort of coming around to this realisation, I got the opportunity to leave, um, which gave me kind of a year to success, really set myself up, if you like, and to, and to go on more courses, to gain more experience. Um, and I, don't, I suppose my sort of coaching journey hasn't really stopped since then, really. Um, I've just been, I, went, I managed to get on the first um, GB Hockey ACP course. Mm -hmm. Um, which really opened my eyes to a lot of, uh, I suppose, being a lot more reflective and, and so on and so forth. And then, yeah, you know, just just doing as much as I possibly can. Probably, I think I figured it out. I think in the last five years, I've done pretty much a, a thousand hours worth of coaching a year, um, <laughs> which could be a debate in itself. But I certainly feel that I've definitely made a huge amount of mistakes in that, and that's given me the opportunity to learn quite a bit. Mm. So um, just to, um, for anybody who isn't aware of the acronym, as you mentioned, the JRPC, which stands for the Junior Regional Performance Centre, as was, now now just referred to as a performance centre. And uh, the ACP that you mentioned too is the fairly new, I think it's the third year running now, of the Advanced Coach Programme that England Hockey ran, which was basically a replacement for what used to be called the Level 3. Um, are you Have you graduated or are you still on that learning journey? Yeah, I've graduated. So I've, we kind of finished, if you like. Well, I say finished. I think that's definitely not the, the right term. Um, completed all the workshops and the kind of module stuff last summer. Mm. Um, but really, I suppose, and this is, I don't think it was that secret. Probably the whole idea of that is to really instill in the, the guys who are on the course this idea that it, it never stops, really. Mm. Um, and, it, and it definitely has sort of, it's, made sure that I, my connections with other coaches, the conversations that I had about how we go about our business, listening to podcasts like yourself, reading lots of blogs and lots of books and so on and so forth, that, you know, you're just trying to get as, as much information as possible just to try and inform what you're going to do next. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, and I suppose the big thing is, is why you're doing it, you know, which is uh, definitely the, the, the major point. I probably didn't really have a coaching philosophy when I started that. Mm. I knew that I wanted to, to be a good coach and I knew that I wanted whoever I was coaching to, you know, enjoy it and hopefully sort of improve. Um, and I was sort of, there's probably a lot of coaches trying lots of different methods to be able to do that. Um, that course has definitely enabled me to be a lot more um, precise, if you like, and have a lot, a lot clearer idea of what I want. Mm. Or, or sometimes maybe that I'm not really looking for something, I'm just looking to maybe create an idea or, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a perfect finish to a session mm. you know, and so on and so forth, which mm. maybe when I was a younger coach, you know, that's what you want, isn't it? You want to get to the end of the session, you turn around and say, right, what are we going to do on Saturday? And mm. they repeat back to you what we've just done. And, and then you, you obviously cross everything and hope that, that, that they do that. And clearly obviously it very rarely happens that way. It's an interesting, I'd be interested to get your reflections on, on the journey because um, England hockey, I think, or GB hockey actually, more than in, in, it's not just England, GB hockey have uh, really, I guess, embraced some you know new, new thinking, I suppose, around coach education. So moving away from a course. So <clears throat> when I did the old level three, you know, it was kind of like a couple of weekends, an assessment, um, you know, that kind of thing. It wasn't, I wouldn't have said it was robust and uh, all that sort of stuff. But, and then I then, I've, I've, you know, it's been well documented on this podcast that I then then went on a 10 year learning journey um, and made an awful lot of mistakes. Um, but you, so the way they, they frame this, so I'm one of the uh, coach developers, mentors, if you like, on uh, for, for four coaches who were part of the first cohort or it might be the second cohort of, of this advanced coach program and it's a very different model is so it's it's a combination of you know there are some gatherings aren't there some get-togethers where knowledge is exchanged there's also like you say there's these kind of uh, self-directed um, workshops there's also your self-directed learning and and uh, you know your own kind of reflections of your learning journey and then there's obviously conversations with mentors and or coach developers helping to guide the journey but a lot more emphasis is placed on you the learner kind of managing your own learning program and I suppose I mentioned the word graduation there's like an end point isn't there which is almost like when the support stops but in reality that's just a point in time there is an ongoing learning journey but but essentially it lasts around about two years if I'm right in thinking I'd just be interested to get what your reflections are on, on that whole process yeah definitely I mean it kind of sometimes when you're going through it I think a lot of people I think in the first year it for a lot of the guys that are on my sort of cohort, if you like, that first year, we thought it was, it was a bit slow. Oh, what were we, what were we supposed to be doing? Because it wasn't that directed. Mm. Um, and then you kind of get into the second year. Um, there was a really good workshop that was run all around sort of the motivational climates, yep. um, which uh, there was another workshop that, you know, um, it was all to do with, uh, yeah, well, self-reflection and, and all about you. And you sort of, you know, you leave those nights just with your head absolutely jam-packed full of ideas all going off in different directions. And the probably the biggest factor is then how you then digest that, uh, how you put it into your coaching and that thought process. So um, a good friend of mine is an academic. Um, and so he used the word uh, uh, hortagogy. Mm, yeah. The idea of self-learning, which is yeah. a bit sort of, uh, and I've only just discovered that recently, I didn't know, but it, it probably I would say for the guys who designed the course, I would say that probably that is their biggest aim is to try and create self-learners, people who are, go out there. And I'd say probably the biggest thing for me is that since I've left the course, I was like, oh, where am I going to get my information from now? Um how, hang on, I need to start making other contacts. So I've, I've, what's been great about it is there actually is that list of people, um, even including yourself, who are, who are able to, you can, you know, send an email to and say, I really need to chat about something. And, and I probably wouldn't have had the confidence to do that before the course. Mm -hmm. um, whereas now, you know, I've definitely embraced the idea that you can get information from anywhere pretty much. Um, and it's all about just asking questions. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and, and, and well, probably going back from a practitioner point of view, then just trying them out, 
you know, and and saying and seeing what works, you know, that it, there isn't a, a perfect model mm. that you have to either a stick to or b follow sort of religiously. It's about trying things out. It's about you know. You, you don't you can't do a personality check on every single member of your squad the first time you meet them and then somehow magically know what turns each of them on mm. it takes a long time and some coaches who are maybe a little bit more just session by session driven think that you know this is how I'm going to do it and everybody's going to respond the same way and of course the reality is that you know that just you know I can I can, I've, I've, I've been coaching at a university and I've been there five six years um and so there are some girls who are master students who I've, you know, had a lot of contact time with over f- four years. And, and there are some times where I, I kind of think I really need to do this, but I know it's not going to land that well with X or Y. Yeah. I, mean, I need to go and chat to them because and explain to them that this might not be the thing that they really like, but it's important for the team. Yeah. Um, or frame it in a different way to them or, you know, spend a lot of time. And it, that just takes time. And, and when they're in their first year, their first few sessions, you know, I think some people really set themselves up for, for you know, to, to feel to feel really bad about their coaching if if some of the people that they're coaching didn't enjoy it. <laughs> you know, it takes a long time to get to know people and and to to find out what works what works for certain groups. The classic one is obviously you take a a practice design or a session that you've done with one group, maybe a performance centre with under fifteen boys, and then you take that to a group of nineteen and twenty year old girls. Um, even though you kind of want the same thing, you want the same outcome, you want them to be thinking in the same way, but it it, it totally fails in the simple fact that it's pitched in, a, in the wrong way to them. You know? And again, you just don't learn that by reading books. I suppose you've just got to get out there and try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and often it's about, like you say, it might not be that it's fundamentally that the practice design is flawed in itself. It's just the way it's pitched or the expectations you have of the speed at which an, a group of individuals might progress through a particular practice. And, you know, at what stage? I mean, that was a massive learning of mine. It took me ages was, you know, I, I would always expect that the group should have progressed through the session yeah. as for, and they, they rarely did. And I would, I would just get so kind of not frustrated overtly, but certainly internally as to like, why, why have you not got this far with this? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's quite straightforward stuff, isn't it? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's an experience thing, isn't it? I mean, it's definitely one of the benefits is of, of maybe staying at one place for quite a long time, especially when you see it sort of through. That's what I quite like about universities, really, is when people come when they're 18, they're, they're basically children still. You know, they, they, they're kind of, they might pretend to be adults a little bit and, and, and have certain, obviously, ideas. But generally speaking, you, you get some, very, obviously, across the board, you get some really mature people at, at 18. But by the time they get to 21, the difference in their outlook, their confidence on the pitch, the decisions that they're making and so on and so forth. And, of course, that all comes down to being comfortable in the environment, uh, a real knowledge of what what – uh, what's expected of them, um, knowledge of themselves, just being, you know, just being more confident as, as individuals. Um, and you, you don't get a chance to see that sometimes when either you're coaching adults who are already, if you like, mature mm. and and maybe a little bit more fixed and potentially at the other end of the spectrum when I'm in primary schools, um, you never get long enough with them to see anything, you know, and, and those, those timelines, are, you know, it is years. Um but that's quite nice as well when you do see that, when you see someone really sort of grow and and um, have their little moments of sort of breakthrough where you suddenly think, oh, they've never done that before and suddenly they do it. And uh, and the confidence that gives them and so on and so forth. You know, that's really nice. Mm. So in terms of, um, the, the, I guess, the takeaways from that learning journey that you've been on, um, well, firstly... Well, no, actually, I'll just stay here. Um, we're, with this learning journey, I mean, what, what would you say has been sort of the, the revelatory moments, if there have been any, and, um, or, or what have been the big eye-openers for you, I suppose? Um, well, so very early on, I had a disaster, um, <laughs> which was, as, as some people some people have sort of minor little things. I had a real car crash. Uh, <laughs> it was when I was, uh, I was a JRPC coach, Um my sort of coach mentor, as they were at the time, I think it, I thought, well, they might have been tutors or CCCs. I can't remember. They were called something. Mm. Um, wasn't there. Um, although, actually, it turned out that my soon-to-be 
I think, or maybe just appointed um, ACP mentor, was on the pitch. And thank goodness he was. <laughs> so um, it was pouring with rain. The girls were cold. My assistant coach wasn't there. So I was trying to get through to somebody else who I never really met on the pitch, what I wanted out of the session. Uh, it was really complicated, the practices that I designed. Um, it was, you know, none of the girls understood it. It was really badly pitched. And and I kind of, but I'd done loads of planning for it, Stu. You've got to understand, I've like, had pages written down. It was going to be the best session ever. because You're, like, you're I, invested in it now, aren't you? Oh, my, my ACP mentor was there. He was watching me coach. This was going to be brilliant, you know, and, and it was awful. Um, and I kind of had just had to stop halfway through and I just went over and I said look you've got to help me out here because um this no, this isn't going right it's it's not good I need to just start again because the girls are looking at me as if I don't know anything you know and, and quite possibly that was maybe also because he was there and I was feeling the pressure and but there were loads of things that went wrong but as a result of that I kind of like I stripped a lot of things back and I went back to you know if we talk about principles of play and all that kind of thing and and, and sort of what the what the game needs then I was like, why isn't my coaching like that? You know, which is, you know, why, why do I have to get so complicated about it? And a couple of weeks later, I was then on another England hockey sort of camp and it went really, really well. Um, and it wasn't, sim- it wasn't because I sort of had changed anything drastically. It's just I was much, much clearer in my thinking about this wasn't about me or about impressing somebody else. It was literally like, what, what do the kids need in this two hour session and how can I do it? as simply as I possibly can and you know so that really made that's made a big difference to my coaching ever since I think um sometimes I do reflect I think maybe I do need to get a bit more complicated because you do listen to some coaches and their level of uh real detail uh, is superb but that just isn't me and so another big takeaway from sort of the ACP is, is to try and be really authentic mm. you know um I think I'm probably quite an empathetic coach in terms of being able to just to talk to individuals. I'm not particularly great at, you know, huddling everybody around in a big group and trying to get a message across to 25 people at the same time. But I don't, I don't think you need to do that or I don't need to do that. Um, I think that's kind of there. There's sort of the big things, I suppose, you know, uh, we're again, without sounding, so it's that idea of like knowing yourself, isn't it? You know, who, who you are, what you're about as a coach. Mm. And then you kind of start from there. Mm. And now there's something interesting in what you've said there. So you described the session as being like complicated um, and then said, you know, because you hear other coaches and they've got real high levels of detail. Having said, so it's interesting though, isn't it? Because there's a difference between being detailed and having a, an in-depth understanding of specific technical aspects or whatever it might be and complicated in terms of delivery and message. And I actually think that's something often people kind of get mixed up, which is in order to get detail across to individuals, we need somehow to have something that's very complicated. Um, and, And as a result, often the complication almost gets in the way of what we're trying to achieve by which is to actually get into the detail does that make sense yeah totally yeah and i think um so a, a good a, yeah well you're right yeah you're totally right i think having a, a method of basically being really clear in your objectives yes so people know what they're talking about so you can be have quite a detailed objective yes um but it can be in a broader you know, game-like situation. Yes. Because in hockey, obviously, you know, there's, there's always someone trying to stop you. Yeah. And therefore, you you can be detailed about things, but you're relying on other people a lot of the time, <laughs> you know, mm. either on your team to move, to give you a, a good pass, whatever that looks like, um, where the defenders choose to go, where the goalkeeper's standing, all those kind of things. So, you know, the detail for me probably comes more in, trying to get the guys to all to all be on the same page, that idea of like a shared vision of, yeah. of what they're trying to achieve, yeah. um, as more than the detail of where to put your hand on the stick um, yeah. or something like that, which, of course, changes all the time. Uh, I 
think sometimes when a DC coach is, they're probably just a little bit more, uh, could be maybe more specific about their tactics. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore the detail is in the kind of uh, bigger picture stuff. Um, yeah. More of a helicopter view, I suppose, in terms of, but then zooming in and saying, you know, um, could move here, could move there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I probably haven't really perfected how I feed that back yet. You know, <laughs> I don't know, like a lot of guys use obviously a lot of video to be able to then look at that. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure in every case that sort of players always see themselves. You know, I think it's, it's an art to watch yourself play hockey mm-hmm. and then to sort of relive what decisions you were making at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can do that even in real time. You know, we can sort of ask questions: What were you thinking then? Um, why did you move into that space? And it takes a lot of practice to, 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 to actually to train in a way that, that you're almost recording what you're thinking, mm-hmm. you know, um, which is something I'm, I'm probably working on at the moment really is trying to get a, a method. Um, I recently went on um, uh, Mark Bennett's mm-hmm. PDS masterclass, mm. which probably gives a fantastic, you know, well, a really good way of players being able to regulate what their decision making is in the game and to sort of be responsible for it. Yeah. Um, you probably could ask, does it matter if they can tell me? <laughs> Maybe, you know, um, if they're doing and if they're interacting with their teammates and there are other people on the pitch, mm. you know, whether or not they can then explain that to me doesn't mm. matter. Yeah. Um, again, probably a time thing. You know, that's something I'm, you know, that's probably the next frontier for me in my coaching. Um, the the player characteristics, how you how you can influence their behaviours, how you can influence the way that they interact as a team, their feedback, their communication between each other. Yeah, you know, I'm not as bothered about what they talk to me about. It's about how they're how they're solving the problems together in the game, not, yeah. not stopping the game and then having a chat about it. Yeah. The game. And that's where the detail comes from, from my perspective. It's about the players beginning to ha- beginning to develop a detailed framework for interaction. So they're mm. precise with each other. So I don't know, you, you've obviously had this experience. I think most of us have, which is when you do get the players together in the huddle, you know, the huddle, and I do see a lot of very long huddles, right? And, and they're discussing, you know, and the coach is facilitating the conversation and maybe probing with some questions. And it, it's great. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's really good. But I see the players being really general in, oh. their, in the information they're providing. Very, very general. And so often it's about probing deeper to get the detail out of them rather than allowing them just to talk to each other in generalities. But I do see a lot of coaches working now where they, they've got a group of players, the players are talking in generalities and the generalities are roughly somewhere, not always, but sometimes in the rough area of where we're trying to explore within. And that's enough. That's okay. And, and, and the coach just lets it go. And then the game gets played and we're scoring and we've got clickers and we're doing all that stuff. But we're not actually seeing necessarily the player interaction. We're not seeing the player accountability, their individual accountability to the behaviours they've agreed. We're not, they haven't agreed to hold themselves accountable to a certain set of behaviours or anything like that. So one thing to love about Mark's uh, stuff the fr- is a framework, really. And it's just creating a framework to enable both individual accountability, peer-to-peer interaction, and then a moment at which a coach might get involved to hold those players accountable to agreed actions. That, for me, is one of the most powerful bits. And I'm with you. I'm still trying to get better at that. Um, uh, but Because it's not. I don't think that's an easy task at all, <laughs> depending on the group that you've got. No, definitely not. I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I see it as really that my probably my big focus over the next couple of years is, is, is really sort of trying to add that into be to be really a craft and it is an every time thing yeah it's not like another tool in your toolbox that you can pull out for the naughty kid or something like that yeah it's something that you have to do every time yeah um and by having it as a i think i described it as a protocol i think i came away with you know that it is this, literally this is how we interact and you create that sort of feedback loop mm-hmm. that is just continuous, you know, mm-hmm. and the best teams that I've either played on or, or been involved in, they kind of have that on the pitch naturally. Um, 
a lot of the time when they're really good friends, you know, yeah. um, a lot of, so of the, you know, we talk about culture and all that kind of thing, but basically it just means that you trust the guys that you're playing with, that you respect them and that you work hard for each other. Yeah. And if you've got that environment, yeah. a lot of that kind of feedback happens because a lot of the time in a lot of coaching environments, you, you don't have that or you then try and force it in maybe uh, ways that aren't natural, which maybe then feel a bit forced. Mm-hmm. I think the great thing about having a protocol, you know, if you if you if you're really fundamental with it, it, it becomes the way that you communicate, and then it's really effective. I mean, the, the big the big thing for me is you just you just sort of see how deep the engagement is during the sessions when they're thinking in that way. Yeah. You just get further. Because the players are doing so much more of the heavy lifting themselves. You don't have to say too much. As long as you, you're facilitating that protocol almost, you know, so you're saying, right, you know, this is how we're going to talk to each other. Mm. It, 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 can, it can really be massively beneficial. Um, going back to the detail thing, you can, you can then obviously, the players can really get into the detail about what's important. Yeah, you know, and what they need and what they must focus on. And, and the other thing that I think is really good about it is it doesn't affect your practice design at all. No. You know, um, you can choose any way of of creating a session and use that way of communicating in it. So you can be doing some really, really big game, big picture stuff where they're talking, but you can do some really small stuff, and it's still just as important um, and 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 just as useful. Yeah, hundred percent. Now, what, what's really interesting about this for me is, I mean, one of the stimulations of this conversation was, um, I, I guess, a discussion that I've been, I was having um, with a few, a few people on Twitter this morning <laughs> um, around this whole idea of methodology and the, whole yeah. idea, and the whole argument around it depends. And obviously, that was a big part of what one of the previous podcasts around it depends. And I'm, so for me, um, I mean, I think some people are saying that, um, you know, I'm out there and there are others out there who are basically saying that this approach is ubiquitous and it applies in every single context, regardless of, you know, regardless of situation. And, and, and I don't know why people have got that impression. If I've been putting that out there, then... Uh, I'm, I clearly need to row back from that because there's no way that I'm ever going to say that, you know, the kind of ecological approach is applicable in every single context. Yeah. However, <laughs> one thing that I do think is important to say is I think there are applications of an ecological or pr- approach or there are ecological inspired applications applicable in a range of contexts that would not normally be applicable. And I still think it is that whole area is worthy of further exploration. I still think it's relatively new. What you're talking about there, so for example, the idea of an indiv- a group of individuals um, who are in a dynamic team context, uh, learning to perform together, um, learning to interact together and for the coach to say that we're going to devise an environment and we're going to use a framework and a protocol that enables peer-to-peer interaction so that the the dynamic of peer-to-peer individual within environment and the information informa- and getting shared a shared sense of the information that is being provided by opponent or whatever as a means by which for those individuals to organize themselves and group themselves um, is, in my view, a a fairly fundamental way of conceiving of how humans interact. And so I think that is a very challenging thing to do and requires a lot of expertise and effort to do so. Um, And we, we, we continue to forge that path. Now, does that therefore mean that like instructions are never uh, valuable or something like instructions are never valuable or yeah. a more directive explicit approach is never valuable no no one's ever saying that it's not valuable but if your intention is to foster peer-to-peer interaction and for the players to be more in control or more i guess uh, leading how they're going to devise that interaction process so that they're able to do that without any coach intervention whatsoever, because that's pretty much what happens in a performance context. If you're thinking of the game 
or the way the game is played in that way and you're thinking of those sorts of things then utilizing instruction or utilizing explicit methods it, it really actually is, can be pretty counterproductive so you, you might choose depending on who you are to say well i'm just going to take that out of the toolbox because it could potentially get in the way of what i'm trying to achieve now that's not saying this is the only way to do it it's just about making informed choices about approaches based on the way in which we we view human interaction and human development um and i want to just think i think that's a really important point to make um and i, I don't know I, I don't know what your stance on that is well i mean yeah it was kind of like one of the motivations this morning when i text you just to sort of say that you know i find it as a practitioner that sometimes on twitter it's a bit patronizing of um other people who maybe don't agree with a games based constraint ecological dynamics however you want to kind of frame it yeah um in the as if the I mean, because I kind of agree with it, it depends. I mean, I'm thinking all the time, what is the best method? Mm. It's just that I've decided that the best method might be a games-based constraints approach, you know. Um, yeah. and, and, and that's the bit that sort of like, you know, it, it, but as soon as you do that, oh, no, you're just listening to Stuart Armstrong. You're clearly unthinking. <laughs> you're a zombie that's just being fed all Brainwash. this. Brainwashed. You know, <laughs> and, and, and I just find that a bit patronising. You know, why, why can't I have had, you know, and have had done to me? And I, I mean, I think I started playing hockey in 1986, yeah. Um, I did an awful lot of drills. I mean, I love hockey, so I didn't mind doing it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I was one of these people. If I, if I, if I think back of, of how I learned hockey, yeah. I did dribble up and down my house with a tennis ball continuously. Mm-hmm. I did all of those things. I, I had a very lucky that my dad was really good, at, like really into sport, and he played sport in the garden with me pretty much every evening after school that he was there mm. until I was 15. I'm actually, I was reflecting on this with somebody else the other week. I remember the night that he said no mm. um, and that he didn't want to, he refused to go out and play whatever it was, football or rugby or whatever, I, you know. And I, rem- I, I do distinctly remember that. And I fe- remember feeling really upset, you know, that he basically abandoned me at the age of 15. You know, mm. well, who am I going to practice with now? <laughs> um, so I've done loads of different things and, and I've done lots of coaching like that but you know it's only through then and I think probably for me when it became my job when I'm self-employed when I'm relying on the quality of what I do for people to ask me back so I can earn a living mm. do I really then start thinking well actually what what am I doing is this good mm. are the kids engaged could I do it differently you know, all of those questions that suddenly arise. Mm. And then to be told that, oh, no, you're not thinking about that. This is clearly you're wrong. Well, you know, my experience of the last six years is that I, I the first lessons I was doing in primary schools on playgrounds, I put coned gates out and, you know, um, and had all of them lined up, hitting across the playground, et cetera, et cetera. This is how you pass. This is how you trap. Um and, and and it was fine, <laughs> you know, it was okay, it was good, in in the sense that nobody got hurt. I got to direct everything. Um, I was I, I got to be in control a lot. Um, and then you kind of think, well, you know, I don't know how many kids I'm really connecting with the game through this, and so on and so forth. And and it, it probably takes quite a big step to then say, well, it's going to be more messy. Mm. I'm going to create loads of little games in the playground. Um, it's I'm going to have to have eyes in the back of my head. I'm going to have to be really interactive as a coach in that environment because um, if I just stand back totally and just let that happen, you know, I'm going to have to be sort of, you know, a bit more of a a bit more dynamic in that sense. But it gives me the ability to see them interacting with each other, talking with each other, all these other skills. Um, The theme doesn't have to be hitting and trapping anymore on a primary school playground. It could be um, teamwork. It could be challenging yourself to work with, you know, um, I, I, I do some quite fun things where obviously, you know, for a seven year old children, um, pairing them up with a member of the opposite sex is, is an interesting one. And then only giving them one stick to play with instead of two, mm. you know, so they have to share a stick and four hands on a stick and those kind of things. And suddenly, you know, hockey's more of a conduit for lots of other stuff to go on. Yeah. Um, that really just adds a lot more to sessions. And then you take that sort of through all the way to 
um, a, a coach at the moment, a coach Preston, um, the, the men and they're in the, the North Conference. And I haven't done, I haven't done a drill um, with them. And these guys are really experienced, incredibly good hockey players. You know, there's some really good guys there. And they are used to the first 10 minutes of a session standing opposite each other and smashing the ball as hard as they can at each other. Yeah. Um, and we probably, I've got that down to about 30 seconds now. Um, like they can't, they try and get their shin pads on really quickly and get a couple of seconds in, a couple of reps in before I, I say, right, here's the first game. And, um, old habit die hard, yeah. You know, but, but I, I understand that. I, I still quite like hitting a ball against the fence. You know, I'm not one of those kind of people. I don't mind that. Um, I, I prefer it if the fence is a bit bobbly so the ball comes back in different directions and, and all the rest of it. But, yeah. I've, I've also experienced it very recently as a player, you know, and, and I've had to stand in a line and follow a cone and I literally, you know, it, it really switched me off. So I think it, that is a long, long winded answer there. But um, to think that I'm the only person is absolutely disingenuous to probably 99% of coaches in every sport. I spend most of my time thinking about the next session I'm delivering, mm. who the people are in that session and what the best way of getting to wherever I want to get to with that session is, mm. you know, and, and that is the major focus. I mean, I totally agree with it. It depends. It does depend. It's just, you know, it, it, it isn't. It depends as long as you agree with me, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> which yeah. I think is sort of, you know, my frustration. Yeah. I, it's interesting, though, for me that um, uh, that's something I've definitely noticed, which is um, there is that element of it depends, but it depends on the basis of um, it depends as, lo as long as it fits this particular theoretical framework. You yeah. Know? So it, it depends is kind of a veiled way of saying it's not that it's this. Yeah, it can, potentially. It can be. But although, although, of course, I have read the bits, and that isn't what it says. No. It's just that's what they say on Twitter about it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I think there's a big difference. Like, um, you know, there's a. I'm obviously, uh, you know, I speak to some of the guys, you know, uh, who are in academia, and 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 you know, the, 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 I think just the general worry is that there are lots of there are lots of coaching zombies out there who, who, who follow a, whatever they're told and don't think about it. And I just, I don't necessarily think that's true. Having met lots and lots of hockey coaches mm. and spoken, you know, spent a lot of time chatting to them. Everybody is totally invested in their own improvement. I think that's one of the great things about coaches. I mean, you are kind of what you eat. Mm. And if the main driver for most coaches is to help other people get better mm. for the vast majority they want to improve themselves as well, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, 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 and if that's kind of like a basic, if, if that's one of the main characteristics of being a coach is, is, is looking to, to, to improve, that means you probably spend a lot of time thinking about it, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and there obviously there are, there are definitely people that don't do that as well, but you know, I don't meet that many of them, certainly not in hockey. No, no, I mean, I think we're fortunate, I suppose, in, in the sport that we're in, in the sense that the vast majority of people I meet when I'm out there doing workshops or what have you uh, are, as you say, are, are like you, Nick. They're, they're thoughtful, they're reflective, they're open, they're curious, uh, they're explore, exploratory, and I do find that. I, I think, having said that, I also find there are some people who are pretty close-minded and, and are saying well the way i was the way i was brought up is the way it should be and and are fairly have a, a perspective but it's usually the ones with the most experience actually that have got pretty clear ideas as to you know that it's a very technique led thing i mean i think the bit that perhaps people are um i think there is there is there is some misunderstandings around approaches and methodologies that I think people don't quite grasp which is I think they assume that when people talk about ecological dynamics and constraints led approach that that it's basically just people playing games and skills will emerge and things will happen and and there is there is a I think a faction <laughs> that is a bit like that but I mean if you're going to work like that you've got to get your practice design absolutely nailed on and I'm yet to find a way to do that exactly yeah. And and I, and there are still you know game based skillful manipulations, but it's not it's 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 far more nuanced than that. And and also within that, there's still scope 
to engage an individual in a conversation about um, the way that they've tried to perform a particular action or movement uh, and you can still guide them as, as well towards more or less effective ways of, p of performing a particular movement. So it's not like we're just going, right, there's a game, off you go, let's see what emerges. That, it's not, it's not as, as laissez-faire as that. Um, but I do think there's a perception that that's the message that's coming across. And I don't, don't know what I can do anymore to say it's definitely more than that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I kind of think as well, you know, <sighs> Again, you, as a coach, you kind of get found out if you did that because players aren't stupid. Mm. And if all you're doing is setting up a game yeah. every week and saying, just play, yeah, th th you know, th there's, it's probably only going to be like week three and they're like, well, what are you doing? You know, why are you here? Yeah. We, we could get an umpire for half the cost of a free evening and, yeah. you know, and, and that would be the end of it. And I think um, when – I probably did go through a little phase where I was probably too passive – and, and two, just right, I'm going to set this game up. But now I would say you're, you're, you're dead right that for me, if I'm going to create a game, and sometimes the constraints could be quite points-based, you know, you know, this is sort of the, the aim. But then a lot of the time it will be time. Mm -hmm. It could be the space that they're playing in. It could be the numbers. Um, a lot of the time, so maybe at the more, at, say at the higher end, um, at so at Preston, well, I mean, just recently, I've been doing a lot of things. We, we obviously video the game. We have stats. Mm. So we see how many times we get into the final quarter of the pitch. Mm. And if we only manage to get in there nine times, well, probably a practice that's around the, the last quarter of the pitch, well, you've got nine goes. You know, and actually the constraint is you've got to be really, you, you know, suddenly it matters if you're not going to get another ball. Mm. You know, if this is it, you know, there's, there's a lot of relevance there. There's a lot of... Um, players can you know can visualize that pressure from the game because you're saying well look this is what happened at the weekend we only managed to get into this area of the field this many times this is how many goes you're going to get mm -hmm. and you get you know and, and that and that can be a way i think you know i still see that as being quite a heavy psychological constraint on their performance and then how they adapt to that and how you defend within that is really really interesting you know and players definitely respond to, to those kind of scenario based very specific um outcomes but then what they do to get there and what they do within it is what we talked about earlier it's how they interact with each other it's how they solve those problems in the game it's all of those kind of things which this approach really allows for yeah. it's not um move the ball here then move the ball there somebody runs there somebody runs here and then and then and that happens because of course we know that you can only do that a couple of times and, and then the defence move <laughs> yeah, and, and suddenly it doesn't work, you know, and, and you've yeah. got to recreate if you like. And that's what's so great about it, I think, because it does pretty effectively recreate a lot of the pressures of playing. It, it, you know, you can never 100% recreate game-based pressure in practice. But then and maybe another thing that I've kind of learned is, well, Okay, so cup finals, you know, you want to win those. If you're in a cup final and you know that if you lose, you don't you don't have another go next week and it's the last game of the season or, you know, if you win this game, you stay up. You know, there are some games that do mean a lot. Yes. But for the vast majority of time, well, you, you know, games on a Saturday are a great way to practice pressure for the next Saturday. <laughs> you know, and, and, and then, uh, you know, you see a lot of coaches that are really good in training and empowering all their players. And then at the weekend, as soon as there's three points on the line, they, they take all of that ownership back off their players mm. and they, they start shouting and directing traffic again or whatever it might be. You know, it could be a lot more nuanced than that. It could be that the game plan on a Saturday is very directive. Um, so, you know, you, you, you either, you're either in, and that's where I do kind of agree with this, you know, pick a side, I think was what you guys used in the last one, which is you are either in for a penny or in for a pound. If you're going to empower players, if you're going to say, look, you guys have got to make the decisions, you, you, you can't just train like that. You have to play like that at the weekend. And if you happen to lose playing like that, well, that's fine because you might win next week, you know. Absolutely. And that's a really, really good point that I'm glad you've made, which is, the, there is that element, isn't there, of it's not about saying um, I'm I'm doing this to the exclusion of all other approaches. It's an active choice to exclude. And it's not because you've been dogmatic. I just believe in this. It's 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 saying that that 
um, you you kind of can't work to to get players to be empowered, bought in, moving, you know, working in this way. If at the 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 moment there's a bit of pressure on, immediately you're going to disempower them. It, you kind of can't do that. It just it doesn't work. It's like no point doing it in the first place. Tell them what to do and go out there and let them do the game plan. That you should, you know, it's almost like do it that way or don't. And the idea of right, well, we'll have a little bit of a blend and a little bit of both. For me, that's a little bit like I feel. It feels to me that's a little bit of a cop out. Is people are sort of saying, well, can't I just hold on to some of the things I've done traditionally because you know they they were okay, they kind of worked for me. I, I want to go into your new new world of this, you know, oh new newfangled way of working. I want to do that, but I want to still hold on to the stuff that I know. It's like a comfort blanket. And there's a part of me that sort of says, you can just understand the limitations of doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely, and 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 uh, it all depends on what your what your ultimate goal is, isn't it? You know, if if your ultimate goal is to be defined from where either you where you finish on that one weekend or where you finish at the end of the season, or if your ultimate goal is maybe um, where the club slash your team might be in three or four years' time, and how you can see the sort of benefits of sticking with something over over a period of years, yeah. then suddenly you're hopefully, well, in my, in my personal experience, it kind of, it opens you up to being more willing to just say, yeah, you know, this is tough now, but it's getting better. Yeah. Um, and you can be kind of less knee jerk about giving the answers, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I would say, I'm still not 100 percent at it, you know. Um, some so I would, there's a couple of differences. So, for instance, on a Wednesday, on a sort of Bucks Wednesday, you know, university teams, one of the hardest things for me is coaching uh, a men's team at the uni first, and then a women's game straight after. Right. Because you do, I do have to slightly tweak not my personality or anything like that, but my interactions and how I interact. Mm-hmm. The guys tend to be more task focused. I don't have to be um, as visible with the lads. I can sit and chat on the bench. I can talk to the substitutes and and, and that kind of thing. With the girls, and they've given me this feedback, they just prefer me to be a little bit more visible. Um, So we've kind of, you know, we've come to an arrangement where I do sort of, I'm a bit more of a cheerleader, Mm. if that makes sense. You know, Um, I'm, I'm, I, try as hard as possible when I'm in that mindset then not to be directive from the side of the pitch yeah. because it's tough. What they don't want and what they dislike is if I'm just sat on the bench, stony faced, if you like, and really? they, they're subbing off uh, and they don't get a reaction from me. And then if I, if somebody else does, it's like, oh, what have I done wrong? You know? And, and that again is just kind of me making a choice to get the most out of those players and to make them feel really comfortable. Yeah. It's not me sacrificing my idea of, telling them what to do, you know, or taking away that empowerment I try to give them. And and I think that's probably, again, that's something I've kind of got better at. Um, Occasionally, I think I was, you know, I probably still am a bit, I do get so, because everyone's competitive as well, aren't they? You know, so you play sport and, you know, and it's it's still a learning curve. Occasionally I do sort of like slip a little bit, but I try not to. And I think I'm getting better at it. You know, I'm getting better at trying to, uh, the explosions are less I'm free, less free. Umpires now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, do you know? Yeah. Interestingly about that though, what what I thought was really interesting about what you're saying there about, so like you know, approach. So your fundamental approach is that you you are keen for the players to be as uh, to have that sense of agency and to be use the word empowered, but that sense of it's, 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 it's them making active choices in and around that performance environment without the intervention of the coach. So fundamentally, that's the kind of approach. But within the approach, you are, uh, you're saying that you are, you want, you, you, each, the group of individuals have got slightly different, well, they want different things from you. So um, one of them want you to interact with them in a much more passive way. Uh, give less of yourself the others feel feel that they need 
to get something from you. It's almost like they, they don't want a neutral response because then they can begin to believe all sorts of things. So just give me something. It can be negative or positive. Just give me something, right? So in response to that that want, you are you are providing them with what they want. But what you're not doing is sacrificing a fundamental approach based on player empowerment. So for example, if one of those female players comes off and you're going to provide something, it's not going to be do this, do that, do this, do that. Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Because that doesn't align with this idea of decision making. It's more than likely, I assume, going to be along the lines of what do you think about that situation? Or tell me what you noticed about that moment then or can you see anything their attackers are doing i'm assuming it's like that because you want them to be active learners and active decision makers now that's not to say there's never an instruction because it may well be that the time limits mean that there is one but in reality i'm assuming that because of your empowerment philosophy you're going to ask them to be active information providers more so than recipients of information solely yeah, definitely. I would say probably at the moment, in the mainstay, I'm probably in the interactive stage. Okay. So it would be a, a shared whiteboard maybe on the mm-hmm. sideline. Uh, so it's not me drawing X's and O's and, mm-hmm. and putting arrows on them. Mm-hmm. It could be, um, yeah, as you say, oh, you know, uh, do you think we might need to change the shape when they go here or whatever and and then you, we have a conversation about it and it's a two-way thing and it's not um look this is what we've got to do to, to be able to solve this problem because again you know an experience and i'm sure you're the same i mean it's very rare that you actually find someone who responds to that brilliantly and goes onto the pitch and then does exactly what you just talked about you know because it's really hard and they've got to try and actually as much as possible you need them to see the problem as you're seeing it yeah, you know, because they may not, you know, um, and that happens loads where a player will come off, and you know, you you can see from the bench that there's this really obvious thing, and you ask them, oh, what what you know, what what do you think we need to change there? And they say, oh, nothing, nothing. I think I'm playing really well, you know, and and then you're like, right, okay, um, now this is a bit of a, you know, okay, so and and then you kind of start from there, and you know, and 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 then other times you'll have another player who runs off, grabs the whiteboard immediately, and goes, Nick, we've got to do this, 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 and this. Yeah. And, and I'm like, okay, we're pretty going to have to trim that down a bit for half time because that's really complicated. I don't think anybody else is going to get it, even if you do. Yeah. And probably my skill there is to take all of that information and to try and throw it back in a way that sort of, you know, and actually that probably then comes down to what we were talking about earlier about having a protocol, mm-hmm. you know, um, having time limits at half time for, you know, so it's really good that people share and that they talk and they discuss their objectives, but it can't suddenly turn into a lecture from one player. Yeah. It has to be a kind of, you know, 30 seconds each, whatever it might be. A lecture um, of generalities, I often find. Oh, you, you, know, know. you get that minute and a half of very precious, you know, you get a five-minute half-time team to, or half-time break, and you've got like a very – firstly, you've got the faff factor of water bottles and everything else, and then eventually you sit down and all that, and then somebody basically goes, right, we've got to communicate better. What we've got to do is we've got to close down space. We've got to do this. And just basically it's just making observations of words, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. can we be any more precise than that? <laughs> Well, I mean, and I think, you know, I mean, I've, I've definitely got a lot better at that, but it's still a work in progress and we need to practice it. You know, it's sort of practicing it during practicing those debriefs in training so that half time becomes really meaningful and really useful is yeah. massive. Yeah. You know, um, again, it's something that I'm probably um, a bit behind the curve on, but as soon as I think players understanding that, that, that those couple of minutes can be really beneficial or, yeah they can be really negative because I, I mean, I, well, you know, uh, an example the other week we were tuning up at half time and five minutes after half time, we were three, two down, you know, so half time clearly didn't work that day, you know, um, or, or half time for the opposition worked brilliantly, you know, like, yeah, what, yeah. who knows, yeah. um, you know, and, and so we, there is definitely a kind of the, the, how you do that. And then maybe sometimes or some people need is they just need five minutes just to sit down and not say anything and then to go again you know it, it's really interesting as sort of a how you how how different people respond and react but the more you talk about it the more you practice it the chances are probably you get better at doing it you know yeah. um i definitely i've definitely tried to reduce the amount of time i speak at half time again it's a direct it's a it's a, comp- it's a sort of conductor role isn't it uh, One of the things that I always always find fascinating about things like half times and stuff is um, how little the players tend to focus on the, what the opponent do. They tend to focus much more on them. 
we need to, we need to, we need to, we need to. And it's usually based on some errors they're making or something along mm. those lines. Rarely do they, do they ever say, this is stuff that's working well for us, let's do more of that. It's always usually stuff they can improve and correct. So again, that has to be um, practice. <laughs> The idea of let's emphasize some of the things that are working really, really well. Um, but, but equally, there's never, doesn't ever, in my mind, seem to be any appreciation of what an, an opposition is doing. It's almost like, well, that's your job. You're the coach. You should be watching them. We're just going to play our game of hockey. Well, actually, yeah. you know, if you've noticed that they're trying to put you into a position where they're going to try and win the ball from you, they've identified a, or they believe there to be a weakness and they're going to try and get the ball from you. Uh, why, why would you then feed that? Why is there, have we not identified that and thought maybe we can move into different directions? And that appreciation is it doesn't, it doesn't happen, which is one of the reasons, again, for me, it's so important. I feel that the approach is about attuning to information sources. So unless the players are attuning to what is my opponent trying to do here? How am I? How are they trying to stop me from achieving my objective? How can I try and overcome whatever it is they're trying to do? What approaches are there available to me? What techniques, what methods, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Then, unless they're appreciating that all the time, they're never going to be active problem solvers. They're going to be active guessers. We need this. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it's interesting. I mean, you know. An interesting, interesting part of being at Preston is we've actually got quite a few boys that have just come into the first team this year who are still in the performance centre environment, but have been there for three or four years, yeah. you know, and they are so much better at uh, understanding their own game, uh, breaking down and vocalising it. So other members of the team who are often 10, 10, 15 years older than them, but they're the ones that are leading these discussions at halftime. They're the ones who can feed it back because right. they've just done it more. They're, yeah. they're better at practicing it. Yeah. You know? yeah. They've yeah. come from an environment where that is the norm. Yeah. Um, as opposed to it being introduced to them as a 32 year old when they've done the same thing for, you know, 20 years, you know, which is really hard, isn't it? You know, to be honest, you know, who are, who are used to those 32 year olds who've been very used to literally being passive recipients of information from an all-knowing individual who says this is what you now must do they they've never had to work that way they've never had to play and think and be able to then articulate an approach that might be valuable to their teammates because they've always just wanted they've always just played rocked up played been told what to do played some more been told what to do so you can understand it can't you but yeah and, and, and i think you know just to sort of what's been really good this season is just to see how adaptable even 32 year olds are, you know, and actually I think, you know, one of the really nice things is that, that they've really bought into it. And did you have to sell it. Did you have to, did you have to sell the methodology? <laughs> a little bit, but I mean, luckily that, I mean, they've got, a, they've got a superb captain who very intelligent guy. Um, and, you know, he was bought in right at the start. Mm. Um, so, you know, uh, and another couple of guys in the team, well, in fact, my, also my performance center head coach is in the team. So that helps. <laughs> you know. um, so, you know, there's a couple of guys there who are, you know, very much, you know, intelligent uh, and have the knowledge of what we're trying to achieve, you know, right. Right. so they're, 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 they're able to really, you know, to help me. So I've got some, yeah, some really guys on my side. So it hasn't been a struggle at all, really. But it's been any... interesting for some of the players how they have adapted. You haven't had uh, any go, um, just tell me what to do. I think they pretty much knew they were never going to get that out of me. <laughs> 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 so they just didn't bother, you know. I mean, the great thing, you know, if you if you I mean, if you don't know too much about Preston Hockey Club, the great thing is like, you know, the lads don't waste a lot of words, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're pretty. Uh, they pretty much say say what they think, and and and, and you know, and if they and if they if they haven't if they if they don't want to say anything, they won't, you know, which is fine. Mm. Um, but yeah, you know, so that's really good. No, no, there hasn't really been. I mean, I've, I, I, they're really a good bunch of guys, and uh, and and, it, and I think you know, it's, it's, I think you'd have, I'd have to ask them, I suppose, individually, and I have done a bit of this, but you know, I think they like it. They like being able to have more input because they are all intelligent people. They all know hockey. Yeah. You know, it's just, they've never been asked before. And that's, again, it just comes down to practice, doesn't it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think it 
can be a, an alien question to some people. Mm. Yes. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you, um, uh, one of the things I was just listening to you there, I, I grew up in, so my first hockey club was in North Wales and I played Northwest hockey all through my junior years, yeah. uh, North of Hall. And um, great little club and I owe them a lot. And, um, but yeah, when you mention uh, some of the teams that you play against and Preston would, would, have, would have been one of them, um, that like you say, yeah, it's a, it's a fairly robust and quite direct way of approaching life in that part of the world, isn't it, in general? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, you know, I, mean, I, I, I think I love it for that reason. I think, it, yeah, I think, it, yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, that, you know, um, you read loads of books, don't you, you know, about all different sorts of cultures and values and all that kind of thing. And the one thing that you're never short of up here is just guys who are just willing to genuinely give 100%, you know. Right. Um, and, and if you've got that as your starting point, yeah. you know, that, that's a really great place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, the, the world is different now, you know, um, 10 years ago, insisting that all members turned up to training twice a week, did fitness, committed X, Y, and Z hours, you know, that, that unfortunately in 2019, that's really hard to, mm-hmm. to, uh, to get guys to do, you know, um, especially if you think we're in a league with university teams who are genuinely training five, six times a week, who have a huge amount and, you know, and our guys are generally speaking, competing with these guys and, but they managed to just get out of trade for training for an hour and a half a week, uh, in between picking the kids up from school, going to work, all the other stresses and strain, you know, I, I, you know, I think that's pretty impressive. I'm in massive awe of anyone who manages to play anywhere near this standard and hold down a job and a family. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it, it's unbelievable, you know, that they can do that. And I think, you know, especially if you think you could, any one of these guys, if it was, if they just played hockey because they liked hockey, they could they could go and play for a team a league or two down and be the best player in the league, you know. Mm. But they're willing to to make all of those additional sacrifices. Is you know, I think it, I think it's probably a big challenge with amateur sport as a as a whole, as a whole as we go, you know, as, as the world ever changes mm. and people's work, you know, the expectations of how long they work and so on and so forth mm. uh, during the day is is pretty tough. But you know, I, I certainly think it's a at the moment, you, you know, you can still see it as a positive. If, if guys are willing to sacrifice that much to be there, well, I need to give them their best and give them something that they're really going to engage with. It's fascinating how different sports, though, have just completely different expectations and cultures. So, for example, I've worked for a long time in rugby. It is just the norm that you train on a Tuesday and a Thursday. Every club at almost mm. every level. And it's yeah. fascinating, you know. So, like in hockey, I'm the same, right? So, you know, I coach sort of like national league teams and um, uh, and like regional prem teams and things like that. And like, you know, the suggestion that we would train twice a week, you know, or <laughs> and yet in another sport with players exactly the same, oh, yeah. twice a week is the norm. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I used to articulate, why do you train twice a week? Why not just do once a week? And they go, oh no, we couldn't possibly do it all in once a week. It's just fascinating, isn't it? Oh yeah, you know. I mean, I think. I mean, certainly. I mean, Preston. The, the big change and why we've why why we struggled to get everybody there twice a week in the last few seasons is just people are travelling further to actually play there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, five ten years ago, probably ninety five percent of the team was you know a PR postcode. Yeah. Um, we've we've got guys that travel from North Cumbria, wow. Liverpool. Wow. You know, that that it's a big effort for them to get there once a week sometimes yeah. and for the guys who make it twice a week brilliant you know but to 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 make those demands on people is you know it, it it's certainly not perfect i wish we could train twice a week you know there's no doubt about it and i'm sure they do too mm. you know it's just unfortunate that you know it's just really hard and i think um you know and then at the other end of the spectrum you kind of think well you know it it puts even more onus going back to our coaching conversation that that one training session is good that they do. Yeah. We do get as much back, you know, they'll they just phrase there's much bang for your buck. Yeah. Um, and that probably means doing lots of things that are really game like that are really specific to our sort of needs as a team. Yeah. And probably, you know, if I did a session that, you know, even when it's the pitch, the only time I've ever done things that were probably border on, 
directive and autocratic is when the pitch freezes but we've still got to get something out of the session you know mm-hmm. we, we can't we can't waste it we can't not do anything because yeah. otherwise so your, movement, your movements are limited by the fact that the surface has become almost too difficult to be able to put in put a full-size game on and people are hitting the deck so you have exactly. to look at something that's a little bit less uh dynamic in in terms of what you do yeah yeah definitely and, and then again you know that's and the acceptance that it's not perfect, but it's something and yeah. that we might get something out of it yeah. is fine. I think, I don't think that, you know, again, I don't have a sort of, a, you know, a problem with that. My, my biggest problem is I'm so unpracticed at doing those. Those sessions are rubbish because I'm, I'm really bad at standing on the pitch and saying, you move there. Mm-hmm. Then what happens is, you know, and, and actually, you know, my, my biggest problem is you probably need the pitch to freeze a bit more just so I get better at doing those sessions. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, <laughs> but, uh, but other than that, no, yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the things you've just got to try and get the most out of the session um, whilst you're there. Mm. Um, you know, and I think that's probably the driver mm. for, for most of what I do, which is it comes back to the idea of, you know, what, what are the needs? What, what, what does the, what do the team slash players, what do they need? Yeah. Um, and then what's the best way of delivering that? You know, yeah. um, I mean, I, I do remember once being at a session, I'll tell the stories uh, where, the, the coach had decided that two of the players didn't trap the ball very well. Um, so the entire session, and there were 16 people at this session, the yeah. entire session was based around these two guys needing to trap the ball better. <laughs> and I won't go into it, but basically at one point I did ask the question, so am I just a ball machine tonight? <laughs> Which was... <laughs> um, so this, I mean, you know, he obviously, you know, the needs of of those two players were probably being met to some extent, but the needs of the other 14 players were, you know, and it was just kind of, oh, okay, fair enough. Um, you know, and I think there are sort of, um, again, it's just a balance, isn't it? It's how do you, how do you get the most out of, out of the majority for, for the, for the most amount of time, you know? Um, and I think in hockey, the approach that, that it, well, that England hockey are taking with all of their their coaching courses, you know, it's not taking away decision making from the coach to give them this approach as their first port of call. I just think that's because a lot of other people have have gone before and said, well, actually, this probably is for hockey for the majority of the time a really good way to start. And if this is your start point, it saves you going through what you've gone through and what I've gone through and what lots of people have gone through, which is those years of thinking, oh, I bet there's something better out there, <laughs> you know. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure why other people feel threatened by a governing body saying, try this, this approach. Because yeah. why is that any different to before when they said, do this approach with lots of cones and lots of, you know, what, what's the difference? Why weren't people up in arms about them being directive about that? I never saw, yeah, never saw any opposition. No. No. Which I mean, is... You know. It was bizarre. I mean, I like I did three set three sessions and went right. I'm not doing this anymore. A, it's soul destroying, selfishly, and B, I can't do this to children. I'm afraid, regardless of what, if this is how skill is developed, then I'll just go back to recreational sport because I can't do that. <laughs> but yeah. no one said, there was no there's no uproar. No, no, absolutely fine. But yeah, yeah, that's a really actually. I've never thought about that. There was never, there wasn't. Now maybe it's because we didn't have Twitter maybe back in the days quite so much, or there wasn't as much, as much vehicle for the kind of uh, for people to. But yeah, you're right. It's isn't it interesting that there's just vehement opposition to an, a governing body basically saying we'd like to do this because we think it, it might help us to develop players who can make decisions, and we know, and we think it might be more fun, and therefore more players will carry on playing. Apparently, that is somehow <laughs> a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I really. <laughs> It's one of those, I think it's a bit weird, isn't it? So, I, it, like, I really like, obviously, I, I like listening to a lot of the guys that sort of go out to Holland and Belgium and seeing what's happening over there, and, and it looks really interesting. But then occasionally you kind of, you then also read people that are like, oh, well, why aren't we doing it exactly the same as them? Mm-hmm. And I just think, well, you know, you can't, on the one hand, espouse people to be innovative and creative and, and actually have a model. And then at the same hat, and then two minutes later say, oh, just copy what they're doing. You know, it doesn't make sense, does it? You know, you've got to have something that's real for, 
and, and the, that's real for the for the environment that you're in. You know, um, the great thing about Twitter is that there is the opportunity to see all of those different things and to yeah. learn, and, and the amount of things that you kind of you know that you see and then you think about and you think, well, how can that be right for me? You know, I kind of went through a bit of a, a phase, you know, and I and I, I probably then kind of see maybe one of the arguments that, that a lot of the sort of the anti guys on Twitter say, which it, it, it can appear that it can be a bit gimmicky, you know, that somebody yeah. comes up with something and then everybody says, Oh, I'll give that a go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and without giving it the due thought of, well, why is that applicable to the people I'm coaching? You know, how can I manipulate that for the best of the people that I want to coach and not just, you know, and I was guilty of that a little bit, you know, like, um, I'd probably say clickers are probably quite a good example. You know, as soon as, you know, everyone's, oh, I've got to get some clickers. It helps you keep score. And I'm like, great. And then, uh, and then you go, right, I've got to come up with some ways to score stuff because I'm only, like, you know, it's like, oh, I need to come up with some more complicated scoring systems because otherwise these clickers, I can't use them, you know, um, <laughs> which is, you know, definitely the wrong way to go about it. You know, I, I have managed now to, you know, they're in my bag, but they don't come out as often because they come out when I think I need them, when I've created something that is really probably maybe too complicated with lots of different scoring things. Uh, or maybe some other things. I know, like, they probably originated, I know when I listened to Rusty talking about, like, with their parents using them. Um, amazingly, that as you talk about the difference between, say, hockey and other sports, you really don't get many parents watching hockey training sessions. Um, <laughs> no, you, don't. you know, and if You'd you do, they're not, they're not, they're not, I've never, I've very rarely had a parent. Yeah, their kids might be engaged, but the parents on the sideline definitely aren't, you know. Just, they're um, just, they're just huddled together, aren't they, in big shoes? Yeah, yeah, they just like, you know, they, there's obviously a better coffee shop around the corner or something because, um, you know, I definitely don't have that problem, um, <laughs> which, so, you know, there, there's, there are sort of differences, I suppose. But I think, yeah, you know, so there are things that you kind of think, and, and that's where I do kind of agree that's when if you sort of bring it all the way full circle, you know, that you've got to have access to things. You've got to, yeah, it's great to know that, that things like using clickers is a good thing. It's great to know that you can use different cards to elicit different responses from people. It's great to have, um, you know, uh, this vast array, but you've, the, the job of the coach is then still to decide when to use them, mm. you know, and um, the great thing is that, if you don't know about something, and I think that probably goes back to sort of pre this and the old fashioned way, that was the only way, mm. you know, mm. if you, if you didn't know any, if you weren't willing to probably be really creative and just go off the reservation yourself, which obviously some people did, which is probably, you know, why we're here now. But if you weren't one of those original people, you were following what everybody else did. And that was sort of, you know, drills and it was, um, block practice technique led yeah yeah you know and uh a lot of what we talk about i suppose is is on a, is, a, is a reaction to that and there are other factors i think as well which is yeah lots of kids aren't doing sport as much you know so you do need to make it more in, engaging you, you, you know for the for the for the the small majority of, of, of children like me who actually probably quite enjoyed it and, and did quite would do it well regardless because it was sport. So I, I would literally throw a thousand passes. I would go out with a, with a chipping uh, wedge in, in the garden and just hit balls in the summer holidays. Cause that's all I had to do. You know, I was like bored. I was like, Oh, oh okay. Well I'll go and hit a tennis ball against the back wall for an hour. That's, that's fun, you know, and, and that's great. But nowadays there are lots of other things and, you know, to, to keep children engaged in sport, to keep them going again, that's why you potentially choose this. There's, there's lots of different reasons to pick a method, but they have to be relevant and you can make, and you can make things relevant for the people, the, the, the group of people you're, 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 you're coaching, you know? And I think that's why even in primary schools, when I'm you know introducing hockey to, to kids, my main driver is not whether on at the end of, even at the end of, six weeks, 12 weeks, the quality of their push pass, you know, it's, did they really, really enjoy it? Do they like running about? Might they think about playing more sport in the future? You know, are they, you know, those kind of things. 
and you you get that a lot more if you're really engaging with them you know and i think that's really important you know it's some people forget i think that it's you know if you're in a laboratory and you said what is the best way to learn this technique well that might be that might look totally different but it doesn't look like that um in a in a rain sodden concrete playground in the middle of Morecambe in November, you know, it definitely doesn't. It, it, it looks like I've got to get these kids moving. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to make sure they're having fun. I've got to, you know, and, and those are the drivers. And, and, and if you can do that in a way that's, that, that's high quality, you know, that still is good, I think, you know, then you're onto a winner. You know, it's not just about turning up and taking up their time for an hour till it's time for lunch. It's about giving them something that's actually worthwhile. Absolutely right. I mean, there's just, and for me, there is, there is no argument against that, which is, you know, um, for years and years, it's been this idea that, you know, sport is the aggregation of techniques. Well, that's a pretty reductionist view of what the sports experience really ought to be. And it's not a surprise that there's a lot of kids quite turned off by sport, physical activity, and there's research coming out all the time about that. You know, we know, for example, that's, you know, I think I've talked about this before, but um, that, you know, kids are spending less time outside per day than prison inmates. And when you're looking at that context to think then, therefore we've got to continue with this idea that unless you learn to push pass effectively, then, you know, you're, you're somehow not going to be having a, a good hockey experience. Well, I tell you what, I bet you all those kids in those six to 12 weeks you've been doing on that rain, sod, rain, sodden concrete playground, I bet they've come away with big smiles on their faces and had a really enjoyable time and don't give a damn whether they can do a perfect push pass or not. Well, yeah, and, 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 and I think, again, it's that kind of idea that, well, sometimes when you go into, say, schools, the teachers have an expectation of what this is going to look like. Oh, you're a professional coach. It's going to be this. And then when it's not, you know, that can be quite a challenge. I think it, the, 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 the big one is that I, I don't want to be responsible, if you like, for adding to that. You know, um, I'm not, I don't go into any primary schools looking for the next player for my performance center, you know? Um, and I don't really mind if it ever really looks like hockey. What I do care about is that, that they are engaged enough that they really run a lot, you know, and I know that sounds boring, but you know, uh, I want physical activity to be fun. I always see, I always joke, you know, the kids who bring an inhaler out, I tell them they're going to need that in this session. (laughs) Because, because uh, hopefully they're going to run enough. You know, it's not a, um, it, it's not like a, you know, I think they see it as like a, a little protective shield. You can't make me run. I've got asthma. It's like, well, I had asthma when I was a kid and I used to use my inhaler all the time. Um, and I think I only had asthma because I was so competitive. I used to sort of give myself panic attacks if we lost, you know, <laughs> I couldn't, like hyperventilating, I couldn't understand it. But, um, you know, it's that kind of thing, isn't it? That I think there are some schools around here that do it really well. You know, they're really engaged. That, um, they get their, their kids doing just loads of sport. But when I ask those kids again, sort of, oh, you know, what are you doing at the weekend? A lot of it will be, oh, I'm, I'm playing computer games. Yeah. And uh, there's just more challenges with their time. And uh, that, I suppose probably that's actually why it's so interesting coaching such a wide range of people yeah. you know because you've got you go from super super motivated highly skilled right the way back um but the message is generally the same yeah yeah. You know, it's just you kind of change the language that you use you know or, or sometimes not actually probably <laughs> there's, there's quite a few times where i've tried out first team training sessions on a primary school playground i think well if, if nine-year-olds can get it then hopefully you know uh, it's just the speed of it probably speeds up a little bit. But oh, else God, works. it works brilliantly. The stuff I do with kids works brilliantly with the older players. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, because generally it probably means you have sort of, you know, you've concentrated it down to its absolute yeah. best. Uh, there's a book I was reading uh, recently. It's about the, another book about the All Blacks. It's really good. It's called The Jersey. Oh, yeah. Um, but there's a there's a little quote in it. I think it's from Wayne Smith, and he's talking about Steve Hansen. And they they... they don't want to call themselves certain types of coaches, but if they did, they call themselves essentialists, which I thought was really good, which is basically they take what's tr- truly essential and then they, they coach that, they work on that. And that even at that highest level, 
the sessions are pretty much what is absolutely necessary, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you kind of, that's your start point all the time. Well, is that essential? If not, do we need to work on it, you know? Um, and I think that's quite a good way of sort of thinking about a lot of, probably going all the way back to when I was talking about when I really overcomplicated at the start, you know, yeah. that, uh, that, that sort of definitely sort of, rang true with me you know what what's really important and, and maybe those things aren't you know the 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 absolute that the technique is perfect it's, it's probably what's the intention yeah you know and and things like that well i've really enjoyed this conversation i'm really glad we could do it um uh, i mentioned before we actually started recording that there's a new um you've got a, a you've got a new uh, arrival in your household in in the shape of a, a a youngster um a human youngster and i've got a new arrival in the shape of a uh, canine youngster um, <laughs> who's just started to stir and will want to go outside to uh, probably um do various things in the garden play around and and try and eat bits of holly that she shouldn't eat so i'm probably going to have to go but um nick, my son to be fair to. <laughs> i um nick i really enjoyed it it's really 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 great conversation um uh you're on twitter i know i noticed and you know i mean i imagine people might want to reach out to you and pose some questions to you and if you are prepared to give them some of your time which i know you would be how can they get in touch uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Yeah, uh, I don't know, yeah, uh, it's uh, at uh, NKDVY. So, sort of my name without the vowels. Mm. And uh, I'm on there. And uh, yeah, you know, um, I, I think probably, you know, I, I, I'm always interested to hear what other people are doing. I think that's probably the big thing for me. I like to sort, of, you know, see what see what's out there, and then and then kind of you know think, oh, you know, what can I do with that? Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, appreciate all your time today, and uh, and thanks for uh, for sharing some of your experiences because it's been a fascinating conversation. Thanks very much, Jet. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Talent Equation podcast. If you like the show, then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player, telling your friends about it, or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron. Just head over to thetalentequation.co.uk and click on the Becoming a Patron button at the top of the page. 